Welcome back. In the last video, we looked at MIPS pipelining. In this video, we take a deeper look at hazards and look at techniques for increasing instruction level parallelism. To recap from last time, we've divided the data path into five stages. Each instruction moves forward to the next stage on every clock tick. With five stages, the CPU can work on up to five instructions at a time. However, hazards, data hazards and control hazards, will often prevent us from getting our five times increase in our throughput. Let's take another look at a data hazard. Here we see that the destination register 2 will not be written back to the register file and to the fifth pipeline stage. That means it won't be there for the AND or the OR instruction. The diagram shows this by the blue lines going down and back. The data will be there for the ADD instruction and the STORE word instruction. This is shown in the diagram by the blue lines going straight down or down and to the right. The line going straight down is OK because we can read from the register file in the second half of the clock cycle. Let's look at what would happen without forwarding. The clock cycles are shown going across the top of the diagram, and the instructions coming into the CPU are shown top to bottom. We see that not until clock cycle 5 is the previous value in register 2 updated to the new value. That means if the AND or the OR instruction read register 2, they would read the old value, not the correct value. So we need forwarding. But how is it implemented? Forwarding is supported by the pipeline registers. Here is some Verilog code that explains the logic of forwarding. The notation is stage.register, where stage means one of the pipeline registers. The 1A and 1B hazards are when the destination register of the previous instruction is the source register, either RS or RT, for the next instruction. In this case, we need to forward from the EXMEM pipeline register. The type 2 hazards are load use hazards as well as some data hazards as we'll see next. Let's follow the hazard identification and forwarding in this example. The data hazard between the sub and the AND is a 1A type hazard. The CPU will need to forward from the EXMEM register to the ID EX register. The data hazard between the sub and the OR is a 2B hazard. The CPU will need to forward from MEM right back pipeline register to the ID EX register. We need to add one more condition to make sure we don't forward when we don't need to. For example, if 0 is the destination register, we don't need to forward because that's essentially a no op. Here we see some code to check that the destination register is not zero. Here we see the same sequence of code showing how forwarding removed the data hazards. The diagram shows the values retrieved from the pipeline registers forwarded to the ALU when they're needed. What about a load use hazard? Here the contents of a data memory location are loaded into register 2 in the first instruction. But that value won't be written back to the register file until clock cycle 5. Let's try forwarding. Can we grab the value read from the MEM write back pipeline register and send it to the next instruction's EXE cycle? No, actually we can't, as illustrated by the blue line going down and to the left. That means we're going to have to have one pipeline stall for a load use hazard. That's indicated in the Verilog code here that says if we're doing a read and one of our source registers is the previous destination register for the load word, then we have to stall the pipeline. What does it mean to stall or bubble the pipeline? It means that control signals are set to zero so that the instruction can't do anything. There are two things that instructions do that affect the state of the machine. They either write to memory or they write to the register file. 
If we prevent them from doing either of those two things, then the instruction still continues through the pipeline, but it can't do anything. It effectively becomes a no-op. Here we see the AND starting its execution. When the system realizes that a pipeline stall is necessary, the AND still continues on through the pipeline, but its control signals are set, so it effectively becomes a no-op. Then in the next clock cycle, that AND instruction is reissued into the pipeline. The data path diagrams we looked at earlier showed that the determination whether or not to branch takes place in the MEM stage. This means that three instructions will have entered the pipeline before that determination is made. So three instructions may have to be bubbled out. One improvement we could make is to move that branch detection circuitry earlier in the pipeline. By moving that circuitry earlier in the pipeline, we can reduce the branch penalty from three clock cycles to one. Since the branch instruction reads two registers, RS and RT, it can experience a data hazard as well. If RS or RT in a branch instruction is a destination register for an R-type instruction, at least two instructions back, everything's fine. Notice in the diagram that there was at least one instruction in between here. However, if the RS or RT in the branch instruction is the destination for a previous R-type instruction or two instructions back for a load word, then one stall will be needed, even with forwarding. And if RS or RT are the destination for a previous load word instruction, we'll need two stalls. If you remember, a couple of slides back, a load use hazard required just one pipeline stall, so why are two needed here? The previous example showed a load use hazard between a load word and an R-type instruction. Here it's between a load word and a branch. And since we've moved the branch circuitry earlier in the pipeline, we need that data earlier. So this will cost us two stalls in this case. In the last video, we talked about branch prediction. Static branch prediction lets the assembler or compiler arrange code to eliminate branch penalties. Static branch prediction in a MIPS processor leaves a branch delay slot after a branch instruction. This can be filled with a no-op if necessary, but ideally with an instruction before the branch that doesn't have any dependencies on the branch. Dynamic branch prediction is handled by the CPU during runtime. A branch history table is kept internally, where the index to the table is the branch address and one bit indicates whether the instruction actually branched or not last time. If the prediction is wrong, flip the bit and carry on with flushing instructions. Let's work through an example. In this loop, let's say the branch is at address 140, mem equals zero, meaning branch. That's wrong, so it's updated to mem equals one. For iterations two through the next to last one, mem equals one is correct. On the last iteration, mem equals one is wrong, so we change it back to zero. Now this entry for this loop is set up to be wrong again on the first iteration. A stronger approach is to have a two-bit scheme as shown in this state diagram. The dark blue is a strong take. As long as the branch is taken, it stays in that state. If it's not taken, it moves to the lighter blue, weak take. If the branch is then not taken, it moves to the not take, weak state, the light gray. And then if the branch is not taken, it moves to the darker gray. In this two-bit scheme, the most significant bit is the decision, and the least significant bit indicates how confident we are about it. Let's work through the same example again. Initially, let's say mem equals zero, zero, strong take. That's wrong, so it changes to mem equals zero, one, weak take. On iteration two, that's wrong, so we change it to mem equals one, zero, a week not taken. Then for iterations three through the next to last one, mem can stay in the one, one state, which is correct. In the last iteration, mem one, one is wrong, 
so it's changed to mem10. Now the next time we encounter this loop, mem10 will be correct, so we will be correct on the first iteration instead of wrong. But overall this didn't help for this loop. We were wrong twice, just like we were for one bit branch prediction. Let's look at a second example where the branch is at the end of the loop. Let's say again that the first time through mem equals 0, 0, predict taken. That's correct. For iterations 2 to the next to last one, we stay in that state, which is correct. On the very last state, mem 0, 0 is wrong, so we change it to mem 0, 1, a weak predict taken. And now in the next time we encounter this loop, mem equals 0, 1, so we'll be correct on the first iteration. The benefit of the 2-bit branch prediction is that it identifies typical behavior of branches for an overall benefit. Branch prediction is a fast and complex topic in the study of computer architecture. We've just had a brief glimpse into some ideas here. How do exceptions affect the pipeline? Exceptions are really just another control hazard. An exception is any unexpected change in the control flow of a program, like an arithmetic overflow. What happens in MIPS is that the address of the offending instruction is saved in the EPC register in coprocessor 0. MIPS then transfers control to an exception handler. Just like any other control hazard, instructions have to be flushed from the pipeline and begin fetching from the exception control code. As shown in the book, exceptions can be handled with a minimum modification of additional control signals. There are two primary ways that we can increase instruction level parallelism. We're already working on up to five instructions at a time in the MIPS pipeline, and this is on a single core microprocessor. Two ways we can increase this is to either make a deeper pipeline or do what's called multiple issue. Here we see a deeper pipeline for another processor. It has eight stages and therefore could be working on up to eight instructions at a time. There's a trade-off to pipeline depth. A deeper pipeline will cause you to have to flush more instructions on a pipeline stall, which is more costly in terms of your average cycles per instruction. The other approach to increasing instruction level parallelism is multiple issue. On the left we have a diagram of what we've been doing with pipelining issuing one new instruction every clock cycle. Sometimes that's called a single issue or a scalar processor. On the right we see a multiple issue processor, sometimes called a superscalar processor. Every clock cycle we're going to issue two instructions into the pipeline. So now we could be working on up to 10 instructions at a time. This will require a little more hardware as we'll see. Our CPI with multiple issue will be less than 1, so sometimes that is inverted to be IPC instructions per cycle. For example, a 4 GHz CPU with 4-way multiple issue, issuing 4 instructions at a time, would have a peak CPI of 0.25, or flip that around and say a peak IPC of 4. Multiple issue can be handled statically at compile time, or dynamically at runtime. In static multiple issue, the compiler groups instructions into issue packets that will be issued together in a clock cycle. Sometimes this is called VLIW, very long instruction word. Instructions are grouped to avoid hazards as much as possible between packets, and there can be no dependencies within a packet. The compiler may have to pad some spots with no op. For dynamic multiple issue, the CPU can look ahead in the instruction stream and choose instructions without dependencies. Either way, we have to deal with two things. Decide which instructions to issue in a clock cycle, that's the packaging, and deal with data and control hazards. Both of these can be done at compile time or execution time. Reality is often a combination of the two approaches. Let's look at how multiple issue will work. Each packet will have one ALU or branch instruction and one load store. Ideally, in each clock cycle, we'll be able to issue two instructions. This will require additional hardware. 
but not a lot of additional hardware as we see. The main addition is a second ALU. The bottom one can be used for address calculation for load word store word, and the top one for everything else. We also need extra buses and ports for the data path. Let's look at this example, trying to implement multiple issue. We have a loop that iterates through an array, loading an element, adding a scalar to it, and writing it back out. Each line in the table represents instructions that are issued in a clock cycle. With dual issue, one instruction can be an ALU or branch type instruction, and the other can be a load or store. The problem is that there weren't enough instructions to fill the slots, so they end up being filled with no ops. We get a very disappointing CPI of 0.8 instead of the optimal 0.5. As you can see, almost every clock cycle has an empty slot. One way to get better usage of multiple issue is with loop unrolling. We talked about loop unrolling in the video about compilers. It's one of the most important compiler optimization techniques. Here is the same loop that we saw before. And I've unrolled it so the body of the loop is now repeated four times except for the final branch. In order to accomplish that, we need to do two things. We need to do register renaming. So instead of just using T0, the first copy uses T0, the second T1, the third T2, and the fourth T3. And the second thing we have to do is adjust the offsets to the address by 4, 8, and 12. One of the benefits that we talked about earlier for loop unrolling is that you reduce, you reduce the loop overhead. So instead of having a branch every 5 instructions, it's more like every 17 instructions. But the big benefit, as we'll see, is that now we have revealed more instructions that we can use for multiple issue. Here we see the unrolled loop instructions placed into the dual issue packets. Only two spots remain empty. The CPI is now very close to 0.5. For dynamic code scheduling, we're allowing the CPU to execute instructions out of order. The CPU can decide whether to issue 0, 1, 2, or more instructions each cycle, avoiding hazards. The CPU will ensure that the code semantics are followed. This avoids the need for compiler rescheduling, but it still may help. Here we see a conceptual diagram of how dynamic scheduling could work. All of the instructions come in, are fetched, and decoded. The instructions proceed to reservation stations where they're held until any dependencies are resolved. Once an instruction is ready to go, it goes to different functional units for either integer operations, floating point operations, or load stores, and they're executed out of order. The key here is this final commit unit, which makes sure that even though instructions are executed out of order, they are committed in order so that the code semantics are honored. The key point here is that these advanced superscalar processors can do out-of-order execution and in-order commit. Another advanced CPU technique is speculative execution. A compiler or processor could guess the outcome of an instruction in order to remove it as a dependency. For a branch, it might assume that the branch is not taken. For load, an assumption may be made that a previous store didn't use the same location in memory. Of course, speculation can be wrong. Recovery techniques differ for static and dynamic speculation. For static speculation, the compiler will have to include a fix-up routine. For dynamic speculation, the processor can hold on or buffer the results until it knows the outcome of the speculation. Let's look at some data points about other processors, specifically the ARM A8 and Intel i7. These are very different processors for very different markets. The ARM chip is for mobile devices. The Intel i7 is largely used in servers. Relative to our recent discussion here, they both have a 14-stage pipeline. The ARM uses static 
in-order scheduling, and the i7 uses the dynamic out-of-order execution with speculation that we've just been talking about. They both use two-level branch prediction. An interesting thing about modern Intel processors with their CISC complex instruction set is that since about 2005, Intel fetches the x86 instructions and translates them internally inside the chip into RISC-like instructions they call micro-ops. Micro-ops are then executed in a sophisticated, dynamically scheduled speculative pipeline capable of sustaining up to six micro-ops per clock cycle. In this way, it enabled Intel to take advantage internally of some risk optimizations while externally maintaining compatibility with legacy x86 code. However, all of this internal translation of CISC to RISC inside the processor requires more transistors and uses more power. This is one of the major power efficiency hurdles of modern Intel processors. This spec benchmark shows that the ideal CPI of 0.25 in darker blue is never achieved. The light blue shows the hits to CPI for stalls and misspeculation. The actual CPI ranges across these programs from 0.44 to 2.67. This chart shows the branch misprediction in light blue, and in dark blue shows the consequent wasted work by programs in one benchmark set. The misprediction only ranges up to 10%. But that translates into wasted work of up to 39%. That's a lot of wasted power. Finally, I want to mention the code at the end of chapter 4 for matrix multiply in the x86. You can look at the x86 code if you're curious. I'm just going to talk about the big picture here. The matrix multiply code, unoptimized, ran in 1.7 gigaflops. That's giga floating point operations per second. Using the advanced vector instructions that allow for single instruction multiple data parallel processing, the program executed at 6.4 gigaflops. Using loop unrolling techniques, the performance increased to 14.6 gigafloating point operations per second. Mm -hmm.